guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Here we are once again with another rendition of True Footy Reactions. Since our last video, a few different things have happened in the AFL world. Most notably, AFLX. The AFL set out to rejig last year's format and to be honest, I think we saw an improvement. Obviously last year we saw three different round robins with every team involved and half the teams didn't take it seriously and just sent a lot of young players. This year the AFL tried to make it much more of an all-star event and to be honest, I was surprised at the fact that the players actually got involved. I fully expected a lot of the clubs to just hold back their players and not allow them to play. For the most part, I think the players actually had a really good time and look like they're all having a lot of fun out there. And for them, it's actually a unique opportunity for them to play alongside players they wouldn't normally play with. So seeing players like Fife and Bontempelli play together and Cripps and Rewalt and the whole Indigenous Deadly team, I at least got a bit of a kick out of that as well. At times, the whole thing kind of felt like a piss take. You look at the way the players arrived at the game in their weird outfits. I couldn't really pick out the theme of the outfits. Some players really went for that 80s look and others went for a very metrosexual look and others were just completely random. Then there was the whole rock, paper, scissors thing to start the game and you could tell just that the players weren't taking it seriously, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. I think that fun, carefree, vibe is really what the AFL were going for and I think that's what they achieved. There's a lot of footy lovers out there who reject the idea of AFLX and they're worried about their players getting injured and all that stuff. But to be honest, AFLX clearly isn't marketed towards people who already like footy. The games themselves were actually kind of hard to follow. It's a very uncontested style game which I guess plays into the hands of the clubs who don't want their players to get injured. The game was pretty fast paced and pretty much just going end to end and it kind of felt like watching basketball with no defense. I said once the teams got drafted a few weeks back that the team with the best outside players would probably win the whole thing. As it happened, Rampage ended up winning and to be honest, I thought they were the best team on paper. Was it actually a really good spectacle? Probably not on TV, but you could tell that the players were actually having fun out there. It did look like a game that was fun to play. Because of the ridiculous scoring systems and the whole game changer rule, it meant that a game was never really decided until right at the end. From the perspective of trying to get kids interested and involved in the sport, that actually makes a lot of sense. What footy's always kind of lacked is a social football presence. With soccer and basketball and even cricket, you get those midweek late night games where you can just go play with your mates. AFL, there's a little bit of a void in that respect. If they can refine AFLX to becoming an actually really fun game, then I could actually see it taking off as a midweek social sport game. Former coach Lee Matthews actually had a pretty interesting perspective on AFLX. He said he's for the AFL concept even though he's sure his generation wasn't the target audience. However, he says that competitive sport without caring who wins is meaningless. That's a very good point. The teams were kind of gimmicky. He suggests next year they drop the four weird team names and actually go for a State of Origin series with Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia and the Allies all getting a run. Now that's a suggestion that I really like. Footy traditionalists have actually been calling for State of Origin to come back for quite a while now. We may not get it in its truest form, but AFLX could be a step in the right direction. And he's right, it's way more interesting watching sport when you care about which team wins. I had no real allegiance to any team playing yesterday, so it wasn't quite as interesting. Let us know what you guys think about that suggestion in the comments. One thing the AFL did get right about AFLX though, is they definitely chose the right player to mic up. Jack Higgins was in sensational form last night. Oh, Easton, Easton. Hey, West. <laughs> East West. East and West, God. That's a joke I would make. In other footy news, Champion Data have come out with their annual report. For those who don't already know, Champion Data is the official statistician for the AFL. And every year they produce a report ranking each team and all the players and whether they're elite or not. Every year they come up with some pretty ridiculous results, but AFL is a really hard sport to break down statistically. First of all, they've broken down each club's elite players. As you'd expect, there are some surprises on the list. Daniel Rich makes the cut from Brisbane, as does Lockie Neal, but no Dane Beams from Collingwood. That's an interesting one. Personally, I think Beams is better than Neal. David Mundy makes a list. That's impressive. Don't get me wrong. I love David Mundy, and he was definitely a star, but I wouldn't have thought he was an elite player in 2018. Sam Menegola makes a list. Trent Dumont as an elite wingman. Josh Caddy. I mean, he's a good player, but that surprises me. I guess the way they're rationalizing it is he's in the top... 5% in his position or whatever. Bulldogs is interesting. No Bontempelli, but you've got Matt Suckling in there. I wonder if Bontempelli is one that kind of suffers because he moves around his position. I'm not really sure. The Premiership Eagles have five elite players, but interestingly, no Andrew Gaff, but Tom Barras does make the list. Hmm. Now let's have a look who didn't make the elite list. Thank you, Triple M, for your graphics, which I'm blatantly stealing. These following players are ones that they've rated as average. Bryce Gibbs makes the list. 
Charlie Curno as well. That one doesn't really surprise me because his output isn't really reflected in stats. I mean, he's a key forward for the worst team in the competition. Dane Beams, Dyson Heppel, those two ridiculous. Michael Hurley as well, honestly. One of the at least top three key backs in the league. Dylan Shield is overrated, but he, I thought it would have said he's better than average. Angus Brayshaw makes the average list despite coming third in the Brownlow. Brayshaw's a funny one. I think he's got a lot of potential, but his disposal efficiency for a guy who gets a lot of uncontested ball is quite low. I kind of get why statistically he's not ranked that high. I do really like him as a player though. Trent Cochin, another one who doesn't really get a lot of stats, but I would have said he was better than average. And Sydney's Josh Kennedy, gee whiz. That, no, that's a surprise. And finally, they've gone ahead and ranked the teams one to 18. Your top three teams, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Essendon, interestingly. The Melbourne one doesn't really surprise. I think everyone's sort of on board that train now. They managed to make a prelim, and although they got belted, they showed a lot of promise. They have some seriously elite players and pretty young ones too. Adelaide being ranked second is really impressive considering how many players they've lost. I don't think, personally, they're a top two team, but I do think their list is underrated, and the fact that they got wrecked by injuries last year is something that people forget. I could definitely see them being a top four contender this year. Essen is another team who's really good on paper, but really hasn't delivered the goods. I'm actually getting a lot of hate for not having Essendon in my top eight prediction this year. That may change, but I mean, until Essendon can really prove it for a whole season, I'm just very, very worried about tipping them. The rest of the list looks pretty good, other than the fact that you have the reigning premiers in 12th. I think Richmond were ranked eighth last year after they won the flag, so um, yeah. <laughs> and Fremantle all the way down in 17th seems wrong to me as well. But anyway, like I said, it's just statistics and footy is a very hard game to break down statistically. Another semi-interesting story is that Dwayne Russell has come out apparently and said that the AFL are working on a second tier reserves competition by the start of 2022. Now I'm going to admit, I took this off a random Facebook page called AFL Scores and News, which doesn't name their source. So this could be bullshit, but let's just assume it's real. Personally, I'm not really surprised that they're going for a second tier competition. I think it's probably the worst kept secret that they're, that's what they intend to do. So according to this, within three or four years, the AFL hopes to have all 18 teams playing reserve comp. I don't know how that will be formatted because there's gonna be a lot of costs incurred, especially by the interstate teams who I presume are gonna to have to travel every second week. But I think it's inevitable. It's the way of the future and it will probably be really interesting to watch. Moving on for a second, back to cricket just for a little bit. This is the first video I've done since the Big Bash League final and what the hell happened in that game? I presume everyone watching this probably already knows the result, but I cannot fathom how Melbourne Stars needed 53 off 43 with 10 wickets in hand and lost the game. They lost seven wickets for 19 runs in the space of five overs. And some of those wickets weren't even good deliveries. There were a lot, that was a, that was a real choke. That's one of the most incredible comebacks I've ever seen in a game of cricket, even in 2020. You can only really put it down to a weak mental state in that Melbourne Stars playing squad. That'd almost be as bad as being five goals up in the grand final and losing. I wonder if Eddie Maguire knows anything about that feeling. Nah, I'm just kidding. Eddie Maguire deserves a break. He was actually a very gracious loser. But yes, the Melbourne Renegades, very deserving winners. I think the fact that they've won really speaks to the evenness of the Big Bash League these days. That was the eighth season, and I swear we've had at least five or six winners. Not too many teams have won twice. It's clearly a very good domestic cricket competition we've got. Meanwhile, we've also actually had some incredible test cricket going on as well around the world. South Africa is hosting Sri Lanka in an incredible test series at the moment. That first test comeback by Sri Lanka was incredible. Incredible. They were chasing something like 304, and when I looked at the score, they were 5 for 206, and the headline on Crick Info said, on the verge of a record chase or something like that. Check back like half an hour later, they'd lost three wickets for 10 runs, and I was like, you know what? I'm not even gonna look at the score again, because this is game over. They ended up being 9 for 226 or something, needing another 80 runs to win. And the wicketkeeper Pereira just pulls out the absolute innings of his life to win the game. There's something really epic about South African test matches. I love how the pitches are really conducive to bowlers. And I love seeing scores of like 200 to 250 being quite competitive. That makes for really good test cricket. As it stands at the moment, Sri Lanka need 133 runs to win the second test with eight wickets remaining. So that one will probably go down to the wire. Sri Lanka deserve a lot of credit. They had a really bad test series against Australia here recently. They've gone over to South Africa 
Africa, which is just as a hostile playing environment, and they are absolutely shoving it up them, so good on them. The other epic test match result is the West Indies smashing England in that test series. That series had a bit of everything, and West Indies actually ended up winning it, which is great for them. Obviously, they used to be a cricket powerhouse, so you want to see them try and get back to somewhere near where they used to be. I think the whole cricket world was entertained by England getting bowled out for not too many, and then Rost and Chase, the part-time off spinner, taking eight wickets. What a, <laughs> what a ridiculous result. And of course, with the Ashes coming up in just a few months, that's a really good sign for Australian fans looking at that English team, hoping they lose a bit of confidence going into that series. One thing I really do have to give England credit for, though, is Joe Root's behaviour in response to a homophobic slur. So it's unclear what was actually said, but from the sounds of it, West Indian bowler Shannon Gabriel has said something to Root, and you can hear his response is, don't use it as an insult, there's nothing wrong with being gay. What I really like about Root's behaviour here is that it was a it was picked up by stump cam, so it's not as though he was saying it for an audience. He was in the middle of a test cricket match and in the heat of battle, so emotions were pretty high and his adrenaline would have been fairly high as well. And the fact that he kept his cool and took the high road and made Shannon Gabriel look like an absolute douche, I really respect him for. To his credit as well, he didn't out Shannon Gabriel for what he said. He didn't disclose what slur he actually used. You know, growing up in Australia, I've played a lot of competitive sport and people say dumb shit in the heat of the moment. Kids as young as 10 or 11 are using homophobic slurs to insult each other. To be fair, I don't think that in this instance necessarily, Gabriel meant it to be homophobic. There's certain words men use to try and undermine the other person's masculinity. I'm not trying to justify the use of those words, I'm saying they're wrong. But I think we're actually reaching a time where people are more educated about the slurs that they're using against each other. Hopefully Shannon Gabriel and young people watching that game can take a bit of a lesson out of Root's response. But I just had to comment and say that Joe Root's gone up in my estimation. I don't really ever have a strong opinion of Joe Root other than the fact that he plays for uh, cricketing rivals. That and the fact that he and David Warner don't get on. But now, in hindsight, looking at how much of a dickhead David Warner is, maybe Joe Root's not such a bad bloke. Speaking of verbal stouches, there was another footballing one, this time in the Twitter realm. I don't know if you'd really call it a stouch, but it was a bit of a debate. Sam McClure reports that the AFL have crunched the numbers and that total league injuries went up by 20% in the AFL in 2018 compared to 2017. Kane Corns quoted the tweet with the caption, reduce rotations. Patrick Dangerfield chimes in and he's always been an advocate for players having more rest, says, yes, let's give the players less rest. And he's used that Alan from the hangover meme, you know, where he's doing all the math in his head. Kane Corns goes on to explain that more fatigue would equal less speed, which might reduce the risk of high impact injuries. So the fact that players can't go on and off means they won't run as hard and they're less likely to get injured. Now, I've never played AFL, but I don't know if I really buy that one. I'm also not a physiotherapist, but I would have thought the more fatigue players are, the more duress their muscles are under, the more likely they are to get injured anyway. So I don't know if I buy that. But I would be interested in more educated people weighing in on that. So if you have an opinion on that, go for it in the comments. He also reckons the game would open up more and be better to watch. Uh, I mean, you could say that. Players would have less energy to force congestion, but they'd also be more fatigued and their skills would drop off. So there's always that trade-off. Also, just flicking back to soccer for a bit, because as I said, I do like my soccer. Fox Soccer recently tweeted the comparison of Cristiano Ronaldo and Neymar at the same time in their careers, so by the 27th birthday. Ronaldo's played 60 more games, kicked 11 less goals, 70 less assists, nine less trophies, but one more Ballon d'Or than Neymar. I think you have to take these into context. Neymar has played in a better team the whole time, in a much easier league, comparatively. You need to give credit for Ronaldo being the main man at Man United for so many years in a much tougher competition. That would explain why he's won nine less trophies than Neymar, who's spent the whole time with Nessie and Suarez and Iniesta at Barcelona. There's also a consideration that part of the amazing thing about Ronaldo is that he is still such an amazing player into his mid-30s. But to be fair to Neymar, those numbers are ridiculous. He is an absolutely incredible player. I'm keen for you guys' opinions, but I know it'll pretty much weigh in and who you support, PSG or Real Madrid or Barcelona. Maybe the debate won't actually be that good. The battle at the top of the Premier League table is as interesting as ever, and Man City have just set out a massive warning signal to the rest of the competition, belting Chelsea by six goals. Personally, I think this week will be the week they overtake Liverpool, who have a tough away fixture against Man United, who they don't usually win away against from memory. And to continue the theme of verbal jousting, Vidic has come out and said that he wouldn't take Van Dijk over any of Man United's defenders. 
I guess it's not really that much of a surprise. Vidic used to play for him, but still. And one other final little bit of info in the soccer world. Aaron Ramsey has become the fifth best paid soccer player in the world. He's just signed on a free transfer to Juve. And according to Forbes, earns nearly 21 million pounds a year. Don't get me wrong, Ramsey's not a bad player at all. But it'll be something akin to someone like Jarman Impey being the top five paid player in the AFL. Anyway, I've probably been rattling on for long enough. I should probably finish this video up. Hopefully the True Footy Podcast will be back with you next weekend. We've had a little bit of a hiatus because it's getting slightly more difficult to all get together to do an actual podcast. But hopefully next weekend and maybe with a couple of guests as well. If you haven't seen it already, we've recently launched a classic players series. Joycey made a couple of good videos about Akamanis and Ben Cousins and then I made one about Daniel Kerr. Continuing the theme, currently working on a Shane Crawford one next up in the series. I'm also thinking Matthew Lloyd and Adam Goods, but one at a time. I also want to continue my team focus videos as well and I've got the Western Bulldogs, Sydney and Essendon all written in my notes tab telling me that I need to do those videos next. Please be patient, I do work full time, I'm also still at uni so I'm just trying to smash out these videos as quickly as I can. If you're new to the channel and you like this video please consider hitting subscribe, we do all kinds of AFL content. I'm also keen to launch a weekly show just like this during the football season, I'm still trying to think of a name for it, I'm currently thinking the football come down but I don't know if that's too salacious. Anyway guys, keep liking the videos, keep commenting your video suggestions. Hey Jesse, do another Eagles video. <laughs> I couldn't possibly. Thanks guys, I'll see you next time.